This new version, don't ignore the previous version, this new version is much more contagious and I think also much more severe, we believe, than previous uh, MPOXs. This is not just an African issue. MPOX is a global threat, a menace that knows no boundaries, no race, no creed. It is a virus that exploits our vulnerabilities, preying on our weakest point. And it is in this moment of vulnerability that we must find our greatest strength and demonstrate that we are all learning from the COVID lesson and we are playing solidarity. And we just found out about a case in Sweden. Are we looking at the prospect of a new pandemic here? I think once we start seeing it spreading beyond the boundaries of the DRC, there's nothing stopping it from spreading everywhere. And that's going to be an issue for us uh, you know, because there's so much of travel, there's so much of mixing, and MPOX can also occur in a way that's you know very mild. And so people will not recognize that they have this illness. And that's a big issue as well. Right now, it looks like the clade 1B version of the virus that's spreading in the DRC spreads quite readily through sexual transmission. And so, you know, that opens up pretty much, you know, any part of the world. A drug used in the last global MPOX outbreak in 2022 to 23 is not effective against the more severe virus spreading rapidly in Africa, researchers have found. The antiviral tecovirumat did not reduce the duration of lesions among children and adults with clade I mpox in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC. According to the initial results of a placebo-controlled trial run by researchers in the DRC and the US clade, I is a more dangerous type of mpox, formerly known as monkeypox, than clade II, which caused a global outbreak in 2022 and is associated with more severe illness and higher fatality rates. Clade Y is disproportionately affecting children, a trend not seen in the 2022 outbreak and triggered the World Health Organization to declare a global emergency on Wednesday. These findings are disappointing, but they give us essential information and reinforce the need to identify other therapeutic candidates for MPOX while we continue research on tecovirumat use in other populations with MPOX, said Gian Marazzo, director of the U.S. National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, NIAID. The NIAID-backed study did show that deaths could be avoided when MPOX patients were treated in hospital. Researchers enrolled 597 MPOX patients who were all admitted to hospital for at least 14 days. The mortality rate, including those who received a placebo, was 1.7%, compared to at least 3.6% among all cases in the DRC, they said. This shows that better outcomes among people with MPOX can be achieved when they are hospitalized and provided high-quality supportive care, the National Institutes of Health statement said. The manufacturer SIGA also noted that there was a meaningful improvement for those treated early and with the most severe disease. While not statistically significant, SIGA believes the data support further trials in these groups. SIGA's share price fell more than 40% following the results, but had recovered about half as much by Friday afternoon. Tecovirumat is approved in the EU for the treatment of smallpox and monkeypox, but based only on animal studies. The authorization was granted under exceptional circumstances, without the clinical efficacy data normally required. The European Commission bought supplies of the drug during the 2022-23 outbreak, while authorities in the UK recommended it as an option for hospitalized patients. The U.S. also made the drug available to some MPOX patients in 2022 as part of studies into its effectiveness. The genie is out of the bottle. Be aware. Be prepared. Stay safe.
For the latest updates on this developing situation, become a member of the Unseen Report by clicking join under this video or from the link in the comments section. Yes, um, we are seeing quite a different situation right now. So if you just look at the number of cases of MPOX that we have now, it's about three times higher than the number we had in 2022 when the World Health Organization declared a public health emergency of international concern for MPOX at that time. So we are seeing many more cases at this time, but it's not just that we are seeing many more cases, the number of cases is increasing each week. So we are seeing an upswing in the number of new cases. And our concern, thirdly, is that not only are we seeing a lot of cases and the cases are rising, but that the case fatality rate, the proportion of patients who are dying, is unacceptably high. At this point, it's running in the DRC and in broader Africa at about 3%. And that's simply you know, a level that we have not seen previously. And then finally, the fourth character, the fourth uh, issue we looked at, the criterion we looked at, was whether it is spreading beyond the, board, the borders of the DRC. And that's certainly the case. In the last few weeks, three countries that previously hadn't reported MPOX are now reporting cases of MPOX. So it has gone beyond the borders of the DRC. So we got a lot of cases, far more than we've had before in 2022. Yeah. We're seeing an upswing in the number of cases. We're seeing a higher than expected death rate and it's spreading beyond the borders of the DRC. All of that constituted enough grounds to declare a public health emergency. And we just found out about a case in Sweden. Are we looking at the prospect of a new pandemic here? I think once we start seeing it spreading beyond the boundaries of the DRC, there's nothing stopping it from spreading everywhere. And that's gonna be an issue for us uh, you know, because there's so much of travel, there's so much of mixing. and MPOX can also occur in a way that's you know, very mild. And so people will not recognize that they have this illness. And that's a big issue as well. Right now, it looks like the clade 1B version of the virus that's spreading in the DRC spreads quite readily through sexual transmission. And so you know, that opens up pretty much you know, any part of the world in, ter in terms of risk. But it's also spreading quite rapidly among children and it's proving to be quite deadly for them. Why is that? So in the past, you know, populations were somewhat protected because they, you know, the elderly people and the adults had been vaccinated against uh, smallpox. And so that provides some measure of protection. But now we have a growing susceptible population that have not been vaccinated, and that especially amongst the children. So if we look at this particular clade 1B, that's the particular variant of this virus that's spreading in the DRC, and it's only at this point in the DRC, as it's spreading to neighbors, we're seeing sexual transmission, and then from adults, we're seeing a transmission to children. In fact, mm -hmm. around half the number of cases in the DRC are in children, and that's quite a big concern. Would you say it was a mistake then to start vaccinating against smallpox? No, I mean, you know, who would have predicted that we would be in this kind of situation? Uh, you know, I think the decision was the right decision at the time. What we need now is we need you know, a highly effective uh, MPOX vaccine that we can, you know, provide, you know, in the entire community. We don't have that. The vaccine that's available, we don't even know its clinical efficacy, is very expensive and doesn't lend itself to mass immunization. So we use the vaccines very judiciously to those only at high risk. So right now, you know, we, we don't really have the kinds of tools in terms of vaccines. So we've got to go back to public health measures, which are highly effective. And that means case identification, identifying everybody who has uh, MPOX. And you've got to have the diagnostic tests 
So it's not just the clinical diagnosis, but also making the diagnosis in the laboratory. And once we've got a diagnosis, is to then do the contact tracing and ensuring that all of those who come into contact with this individual are in isolation. So you stop the onward transmission. So those publishers work. The problem has been that in the DRC that's affected right now, the southern Kivu, Kivu region, there's a political instability. In fact, there's a warfare in that area. So the hospitals are struggling to function. We can't even get the specimens to the laboratories. There's a whole chain of problems that's mm. enabling the virus to spread in that part of the country. That was epidemiologist Professor Salim Abdul Karim. Thank you for your time and all those insights. All the best to you. Kai Kofa Schmidt is a science journalist and molecular biologist. He joins me from Washington. Welcome to DW. Can you tell us more about this latest surge in MPOX cases? How is this outbreak related to the one we saw two years ago? I, uh, yeah, that's a great question. And I think it needs a little bit of context. So le let me try and go back a little bit, maybe. We've seen outbreaks of MPOX in Africa for more than 50 years, right? basically outbreaks in, in Central Africa and then in Western Africa. And over time, these have become bigger, they've become more frequent. And what we saw in 2022 was that one of these viruses, specifically one of the lineages, clay 2 b made it from Nigeria into kind of the, the global sexual networks of men who have sex with men, and it just spread really fast in this group, affected mostly this group. And then over time, because of vaccination, because of immunity after infection, and because of behavior change, the, this, this kind of global surge died down again. But the situation in Africa didn't really change, and there still we're still seeing this, this slow increase over time in cases. And what we're seeing now is that another lineage, which is 1B in Central Africa, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, has just kind of jumped into another sexual network. So we've had reports in 2023 already that in Kamituga, a mining town, we've seen outbreaks uh, in sex workers. Um, and so we're seeing, again, this kind of driven by sexual transmission in this group. But then we're also just seeing the background of all of these clade one cases that we see in the DRC increase over time anyway. And so you can think of the, the outbreak in 2022 as a kind of you know, a little side fire that was started by a spark from what is essentially an ongoing situation in Africa that we just haven't really attended to over the last years. And what makes this new strain so dangerous? So we don't know, and this is a really crucial point, I think. We really don't know whether this new strain is more dangerous than the strain that we've seen before. And the reason we don't know it is very simply that whenever you see a virus act a certain way in a population, you don't know whether that's because the virus is a certain way or whether that has to do with how the, how the population reacts to it, right? And so we've seen in the past that this clade one virus in the Democratic Republic of Congo leads to more severe cases, it leads to more deaths. But is that because the virus is more dangerous or is that possibly because in that particular setting, with the, with the healthcare system being the way it is, with comorbidities, with measles, chickenpox, you know, HIV infections being the way they are, is it possible that it has more to do with, with that than the virus itself? We, we just don't know that. And so we really have to be patient. And one of the hopes in this situation is that now in the next weeks and months, we will get more clarity on whether we really have to be more concerned about this virus than about you know previous versions of it, but yeah. whichever you know with whatever the answer is, clearly there is an ongoing situation that is worrying. Yeah, there is a lot at this point that we don't know, and that kind of reminds of I bet you as well of a situation not too long ago where there was a virus making the rounds, a global pandemic. There was a lot of uncertainty. What has the COVID nineteen pandemic taught us that could maybe help keep this outbreak at bay? Yeah, I I think the number one thing is what you just said. It's that. There are a lot of you know question marks and uncertainties in the beginning, and we really have to push to to get certainty on them. But then we also have to act really decisively, even while there are still question marks. And I think you know the fact that the WHO declared this a public health emergency of international concern yesterday, you know, fairly quickly and decisively, I think 
is a good sign because I think that is something we should have learned from the pandemic, that, that we need to get ahead of this. We shouldn't wait until it has spread to a lot of other countries. We should try. And the other thing, the biggest thing we should have learned from the pandemic is that equity matters. It matters, you know, that people in Africa have these vaccines available and not as it has historically traditionally been and as it was in 2022, that these vaccines are, you know, given out in, in the global north and in mm -hmm. the global south, where most of the burden of this disease is, there's barely any vaccine available. And I think this, the, this declaration really needs to be a push to change that. Well, thank you for having me. The borders in itself is not the most effective way. Without testing, there's no point of closing any borders. The issue is that this uh, uh, this monkeypox, mpox, has spread very, very quickly to countries that's never been affected, even in Africa, that have never had mpox. And now I think the, t uh, the Swedish case is just the tip of the iceberg because we actually think it spreads much. This new version, don't ignore the previous version, this new version is much more contagious and I think also much more can severe, we believe, than previous uh, mpoxes. So speaking of this new version, which is dangerous enough for a global public health emergency, what sets it apart and how can people protect themselves? Yeah, so there's several clades, several groups and variant, variant groups. This is clade one, which is, unlike clade two, is much more severe not as severe as Ebola, but much more severe. And we think that it, uh, because many, it has not been outside of Africa much, even certain countries in Africa has never seen cases unlike this year. It's definitely, there's very few, you know, back, background immunity against it. It's very different from past mpoxes. So a past mpoxes in itself, we're not sure what is the relative immunity in protecting against this. And uh, and again, most of the world does not have vaccines or against mpox, and, and most of the world is not vaccinated against smallpox either, which is a cousin virus. So we have to be very vigilant. This is almost like a new virus that the world has not seen before. And we know that if we let down our guard, what new viruses can do uh, so to, the, to the world. Right. So is mass vaccinations the way to go then? Yeah, theoretically. The issue is that there are two vaccines, but they are very limited in supply. The ramp up will probably take six to eight months, we believe. And that assumes that, of course, that there's willingness to ramp up and mass purchase these vaccines. So there are limited um, vaccines for these, but not at the global of scale of production to mass vaccination. So at this current time, we can't do mass vaccination. And, you know, it will see how bad this gets uh, before we consider that. You mentioned the importance of testing earlier. China wants to screen arrivals for mpox symptoms. Is this the way to go? Are such measures needed elsewhere? See, yeah, symptomatic screening, we don't really know if that's end all and be all. We know from COVID before that we used to do symptomatic screening, but we realized 50% approximately of all COVID transmission was due to asymptomatic. So symptomatic screening was what we did at the beginning until we realized it wasn't enough. And I think this mpox, the fact that it's it's dangerous, but it's not so severe that you're immediately symptomatic, that suggests that we could potentially see asymptomatic or low symptomatic, like basically confusingly symptomatic, where we don't know whether it's mpox or not. So it's I don't think that in itself will stop. I think screening and testing is very important, of course. We have to do more testing, and many doctors aren't testing yet. But I don't think screening based on impact symptoms alone is right. enough to stop the virus. What do you think about that? Let us know in the comments section below this video and subscribe to Unseen Report for the latest updates.